Good morning. I am Mimi Lichtenstein, and today on Adventures in Luxury Travel, I am super excited to have Dylan Harris here with me to talk all about gorilla trekking in Rwanda. Dylan, thanks for coming. Thank you, Mimi. I'm lovely to be here and join you this morning. Well, you are one of my go-to experts on everything African safaris, and um, gorilla trekking is obviously a unique type of you know safari or wildlife experience. And I know you're deep in, you know, your knowledge base of all the different lodges and different places. Um, so I'm excited to kind of seek all your expertise today. Thanks for thanks for being here. I look forward to sharing it. Yeah. Well, do you want to start by um, I'm going to pull up a map and would you give us like a little bit of an overview of the country um, where where the gorillas are and the fact that Rwanda actually isn't just gorillas, there's other things to do in Rwanda. So tell us a little bit about those two. Wonderful. And I think that is such an important point that you mentioned there, Mimi. You know, traditionally, Rwanda was always a destination for gorilla trekking alone. Um, and that's very much a, a thing of the past now. Um, if we have a look at Rwanda itself as a map, uh, Kigali is the capital um, in the center of the country. It's probably one of the most cleanest cities um, in the world. Um, and then you have really from a, 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 at this stage, uh, you have three main national parks. So on the northwestern boundary of uh, Rwanda, you have Volcanoes National Park. And that is where all the gorillas are. So you're looking, if you have a look at the map, you can see the DRC uh, further north um, west and then to the north Uganda. And in that region on the border is where all the, where, where the last of the mountain gorillas uh, in the world are. Um, luckily for us, uh, Rwanda has probably about two thirds um, of the gorillas left um, in the wild and are doing a phenomenal job of protecting them. Um, but we will get to more information on that a bit later. Then down in the south, past Lake Kivu, you've got Nungwe Forest National Park. Um, and this is pretty much um, focused on chimpanzees and other primates. So you get the colobus, uh, monkeys here as well. Um, you've got two groups of uh, habituated chimps. Um, and when I say habituated, I don't mean tame in any way. They've been habituated in the way that they're used to humans being around. Um, the two groups, one is quite a big group, it's about 60 um, animals, and the other one, uh, the last time was about 30 animals. Um, they're still quite well, wild, um, and it's one of those experiences that we certainly don't guarantee seeing the chimps. Um, Nungwe Forest also has uh, one of the most amazing um, uh, canopy walks, um, and we'll go get into that just now. And then we've got Akigera um, in the eastern part of the country, which is an amazing national park. Um, there's been a lot of intro, uh, introduction of wildlife over the recent years. Uh, Wilderness has opened a camp there recently, well, a couple of years ago. Um, I was up there in June and absolutely loved it. So just with those three national parks and in Kigali for the history, um, you can certainly easily do a 10 or 11 day itinerary um, around Rwanda. And it's diverse enough um, that uh, uh, from a, a topography as well as from an activity uh, perspective um, that you would have an amazing trip. Well, it does sound like it's quite a combination. And as far as seeing, you know, diversity of animals, my understanding was the rhinoceroses, the black rhinos were reintroduced from Europe. They were moved over to Rwanda back in 2000 something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, mid-2005, uh, 2005, 2006, somewhere there. In which um, part they of were the um, They're up in the Akigera. So okay. um, Akigera, we had rhino. There was rhino from South Africa reintroduced there. There was lion reintroduced. Mm -hmm. So where, why all these animals were reintroduced is during the genocide in 2000 and, um, uh, sorry, 1994, um, a lot of, well, most of the animals were poached. Um, you can imagine um, the folks there during this awful uh, time, a lot of the folks went into hiding into the national parks um, mm -hmm. and uh, poaching just purely to keep themselves alive. So there was very little um, from a wildlife perspective in that national park until about probably, yeah, 15 years ago, they started the reintroduction of animals. Okay. Well, it's such a great story that 
they were essentially decimated during this very challenging time in the country and that the population has been climbing back for gorillas, for rhinoceroses, for lions. Um, very much so. Right, a beautiful testament to what the right. efforts in the conservation, which is, by the way, a lot of the money that you pay to go on safari goes to these efforts that you will have these animals for the future. Very much so. And I have to say, from a gorilla perspective, I think it's one of the few conservation projects which um, really is directly related to the tourism dollar that it has been so successful. And in mm -hmm. my opinion, I believe if, if it wasn't for the tourist dollar, um, w those animals would be extinct now. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And let's touch on real quick before we go on to dive into Rwanda, the difference between seeing mountain gorillas, you could go to Uganda or you could go to Rwanda. Why would one person go to one over the other? That's an interesting question because the experience itself is very, very similar. Um, I think it, it comes down to cost. It comes down to the itinerary as a whole. So where are your, where the guests coming from pre-gorillas? Uh, um, and I think one of the things that does that I'm very aware of is, um, as we were talking earlier, gorilla, gorilla trekking is quite an active um, experience. And But there are folks who, I mean, I took my mom, who was 76, um, up the mountain a few years ago. Um, and she's a fit 76. But, you know, in Uganda, when you book... Uh, you or when you book your permit, you get allocated the family of gorillas that you're going to see at booking. Um, so you could end up with a family that is a eight or nine hour trek. Where a wonder you book your permit, but you only get allocated on the morning of your trek. And for me, that is very important because the warden in in the, at Volcanoes National Park in Rwanda is a, a wonderful gentlemen and you can chat to him and say look you know my guys our team is not as fit or they really want to go and do an eight hour walk um, mm -hmm. and he will allocate accordingly so for me that's probably one of the most important side of things the cost okay. factor of course is very different between U U uh, Uganda and Rwanda Uganda the permits are only $650 per person where Rwanda is $1,500 but if you're only going to do one permit by the time in Uganda, you need to fly from uh, Entebbe up into Burundi to where the uh, gorillas are. So by the time you've paid for your logistics, um, it's evened out very much on price uh, mm -hmm. between the two countries. So, you know, again, it's a very personalized thing. It depends on the client, what, what they're looking for and what is most suited to them. In all honesty, we I prefer Rwanda. I think it's an overall an amazing experience from seeing the history, seeing how far the country's come. Okay. Um, it's such a vibrant, welcoming country. Um, the people are just incredible. And, um, you know, I love our guests going to Rwanda. Everybody just leaves there in love with the people in the country. And it's funny because you're going there, right? The gorillas are the draw as we flip through a few gorilla photos. Um, they're the draw, but you get there and you become enchanted with these warm people and this colorful country and culture. Um, so I think that those are some of the unexpected things that are the things that touch people so deeply when they go on almost any safari and particularly here that you're going home feeling really quite impacted. Yes, yeah, very much so. Okay, so gorillas, the highlights are the gorillas. Um, tell us a little bit about what's, we're in Rwanda, what's a day in the life of, you know, going on a gorilla trek? Um, here's an example with a picture of somebody from Singita who's doing like one of the briefings, which happens probably the day before you go out, right? That's right. So that briefing happens the evening before. Um, so what happens is you need to be at the, the National Park headquarters at 7 a.m. in the morning um, on arrival. Um, and just stepping one step back on this with COVID, I went up there in June just to really get a true understanding of how they've adapted things with COVID. So we were, are we not irresponsible by continuing to sell this experience if it's gonna affect the gorillas? And I was so impressed with the protocols that they had in place. So on arrival, you'll get sanitized, your temperature gets taken and you're wearing a mask. You would also have to have a PCR test in order to do this um, experience. And I don't foresee that that's gonna change in the next, you know, year i would imagine mm -hmm. um you will then get allocated a group um of gorillas so bearing in mind gorillas are a lot like humans um as the sun sets they will nest down for the night 
Um, so the rangers know more or less where the gorillas were or that particular family was the night before. Of course, anything can happen during the night. If they are disturbed, they could run up into the mountains, but generally they have a great idea. Um, you then get allocated accordingly and you leave the, uh, the national uh, park headquarters by vehicle um, and you drive to the closest entry point to where those gorillas are, entry point of the national park. So that, it's quite interesting because this whole national park is literally, the, the fence is a wall, is you know sort of a three foot stone wall that you can climb over at any time. Um, you've got the local folk farming on the peripheral of the national park. Uh, generally it's potato farming. Um, so you walk through the fields, which is amazing to start because you just see the local villages and all the ladies are out you know, prepping their fields in the morning. So it's really a joyous, experience just getting to the the wall of the park um, and then you'll go over uh, the wall uh, and you will continue hiking so with while you're hiking or uh, you will have a porter with you so your porter will assist you um, with the hike but they will also carry your whether it be your, your day bag with your water um, etc we highly recommend that you the porters also offer a rental service of a walking stick. Um, you know, it's about $2, so it doesn't cost a lot, but of course it means a lot to the local community. So you have your walking stick with you. And then your hike can be anything from, I've hiked 20 minutes and we found the family, or I've hiked eight and a half hours and we found the family. So it really all just depends on where that particular family is. Mm -hmm. As you get closer, um, your ranger, your national park ranger who's trekking with you um, will stop you and you then have to literally put down all your bags, your sticks, everything. The only thing you're allowed to take in is your camera equipment. Um, and an interesting thing that I learned on this last trip was that even a tripod, they don't want you to take that in because during the years where the uh, gorillas were heavily poached, um, the poachers were using sticks. So the older gorillas still relate a tripod to a stick and they're actually mm. quite fe fe fearful from it and possibly dangerous mm. um, and i just found amazing how these animals can remember so far back mm -hmm. um, so you leave that in and then you walk into where the gorillas are and you have one hour with them um, i can tell you it'll be the fastest hour of your life yeah. you will probably have goosebumps the entire time because it is mm. the most incredible experience um, in theory, you're not allowed to get closer than, they say, seven meters, or now during COVID, it's 10 meters um, to the gorillas. Uh, gorillas don't know what 10 meters are. So, you know, pre COVID, often you would have the little ones coming up and, you know, playing with your feet and um, getting quite close encounters, but safe encounters. The, the rangers are absolutely fantastic. They command of the English language, they are clear. There is no misunderstanding of what they're saying so you really do feel safe um you spend that hour with them um often they're in the bamboo areas and they're just sitting eating the bamboo and um, sometimes you'll find them in the canopy areas um but very seldom on the move because generally by the time you got to them it's about 10 11 o'clock in the morning and like humans we're also looking for our tea at that time of the day and that's exactly what they're doing they're having their nibbles um, and uh, great just to watch all the interaction in that. Once you've finished with the hour, the rangers will then ask you to leave and you go back, collect the rest of your stuff and you start your hike down. Um, the, the forest hike is incredible. You know, the, the uh, topography changes from, uh, from sort of from the lower areas. As you go through, you go through lovely bamboo areas, amazing canopied areas. Um, there is uh, buffalo in the park as well as elephant, um, which you seldom see, but they're certainly around. You often see their dung and their spur. Mm -hmm. um, it's just such a beautiful area to hike in. You're sitting at about 7,000 foot above sea level, so you are quite high. Um, I've never had an issue with you know oxygen or anything like that, um, and most of our clients haven't. And I think the one important thing to remember with the gorillas is for the last... Uh, nine, ten years that we've been booking guests into Rwanda, we've never had a guest not see a gorilla. Oh, and you know, so many people spend all this money, you know, what if? Yeah. Um, and they pretty much guarantee you that you will get to see them. They're not telling you how long you'll hike for, but you will get yeah. to see them. 
You know, okay, that's, so that's everybody get a little bit of conditioning in before you before you head to exactly. Africa. Exactly, and we recommend that. You know, we say to our guests, you know, spend a bit of time getting fit because you yeah. don't want to be totally unfit and not enjoy the experience no. because it is really a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And I will say this summer, our family went to Alaska, and one of my big things I wanted to see was the big brown bears. And the problem there is that you a lot of times are flying into them and the weather can preclude you from going. And my thought was, oh, how terrible to go all the way to Alaska and not yeah, see any yeah. bears. So we lucked out. Our day went. It was amazing. Um, but good to know that you have that track record, number one. And number two, you're just relying on your own two feet to really get up there. So you'll Very see that. Much, uh, yeah. Um, and many of there are. There is what we call uh, the Virunga helicopter, which is literally a stretcher. And, you know, not for people who are, with all the respects in the world, lazy, but more for folk who are literally aren't able to get up, but all they want to do is see the gorillas. So whether they, you know, just physically they've had a knee replacement or they physically cannot, you know, walk up the hill, um, it's $300 extra and you will be carried up and down in the Virunga helicopter. It's safe. It's We've had two or three of our guests over the years do it. Um, and it's, it, for me, it's more of a moving experience when you've got somebody who isn't, wouldn't be able to get themselves up there. Um, and now they're able to see, uh, you know, these gorillas. It's just incredible. So bear that in mind. Anybody who feels they can't do it, it can be yeah. done. Well, so that's so good to know. I actually didn't know that. And I think that's amazing for all the people mm -hmm. who maybe thought that they can't go on a gorilla trek because they can't get up there, but they actually yeah. can. That's good to they know. They can do, very much they so. Can do. Um, what about privatizing the gorilla trek? My, under, uh, my understanding is then they're going to be coming to you at your lodge maybe at 7 o'clock, so you don't have to get as early of a start if you do a private you trek. You can do that. Um, so currently there's only six people can go in and see a family of gorillas uh, okay. COVID time, pre-COVID, and I would imagine probably in a year's time it will revert back to eight. Mm -hmm. The privating, the private experience is $15,000, though. <laughs> okay, so we'll put it, that in the over-the-top category. Very much so. And we've had guests that have done it, and, you know, it's in a wonderful experience. But in the same genre, if you're a family of six, currently you're going to get a private experience. That means you're going to have to go to them, yeah. um, uh, you know, which is only $9,000 um, or when it goes back to eight. So it can be done, but it is, it is that price point there. Okay, we'll throw it in the over-the-top category. Um, and you mentioned before the permits to go see them are $1,500 a day in Rwanda. What about ages? 15 years and up? Exactly. Uh, okay. And this is purely because they feel a lot of folk, a lot of the kids under 15 do carry a lot of illnesses that the gorillas can get. And mm -hmm. obviously our number one issue is the safety of the gorillas. Okay. It's the same as if you have a flu. So, you know, even before COVID, if you are, had flu or coughing, um, they won't allow you to hike. Okay. So, uh, you know, you need to be uh, healthy uh, so you don't pass on any, you know, uh, illnesses to these animals. Mm -hmm. And the 15 is like a hard and fast rule. It's not based on yeah. maturity level then. Yeah. Okay. No, it's not negotiable on that. Yeah, they're very strict on that. And even in the private uh, experience, 15. Okay. And so for the people who might come to Rwanda with younger kids, if the parents want to go see it and they have littler kids, they many of these lodges will still take the younger yes. kids. It's just that they stay back. Okay. Very much. And they have activities. You know, um, your, the likes of your Singitas and Basati have amazing activities for the kids while, they, uh, while their folks um, mm -hmm. are hiking. So, you know, certainly don't not hike because, you know, the kids have to stay behind. Okay. So here's a smaller primate, a chimpanzee trek um, that people can go on, like you mentioned, in the yep. southwest corner of Rwanda. Um, yep, so interesting, interesting to know that the gorillas are almost a guaranteed sighting, but the chimpanzees are not. Very much. So. And if I have to be very honest with you, the chimps, we probably more not than actually get to seeing. Um, the habituation process hasn't been a success as as successful as it could have been. Mm -hmm. um, the good news, though, is um, Geshwati, which is a little national park just south of um, the Volcanoes National Park, has been allocated to the Forest of Hope, which is an NGO. 
um, and Wilderness Forest has partnered with them and are currently habituating chimps in that national park, which we're incredibly excited about. Um, I believe Wilderness will build a lodge in the national park, mm -hmm. so time to come. Um, so to have that experience so close to the gorillas, you know, you could do, it's about an hour and a half drive from volcanoes. It would be an amazing uh, combination. So that is on the cards and very exciting. Okay. And then we're just going to flip through some of the wildlife we touched on, the zebras and elephants and giraffes and black rhinoceroses. I mean, you're not going to just see gorillas if you come to Rwanda. No, I mean, that wildlife there, a lot of those photos I took when we were in uh, uh, Magashi uh, Akigera in June. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Just this summer? Yes. Nice. Good to see they're out there happy and healthy. All right, let's, <laughs> yeah. touch on, let's touch on some of the amazing, beautiful camps, lodges that they have. Um, it's sort of a very concentrated, I mean, Rwanda, I think, is like Botswana, that they are having a very... Um, how do they say it? Like sort of low impact, right? Very cultivated experience. It's not mass market safari. Yeah, absolutely not. And that was that what that does make Rwanda special. And mm -hmm. um, they've also partnered with some fantastic uh, safari or lodge operators who are mm -hmm. very um, conscious uh, when it comes to the community, when it comes to conservation, um, which is really exciting. Um, so yes. So this one is a picture of the one and only gorilla's nest. It has a great name, right? I love the one and only brand. I was just at the one in Montenegro last month and, um, you know, they're hand over heart and very sort of kind, um, generous spirit is pervasive throughout all of their properties. So tell us a little bit about the gorilla's nest. I love the gorilla's nest in the way that it's, it, again, it's it's quite a large lodge in comparison to the other lodges in the area. But the way it has been sort of spread out in the forest, you would never think so. Mm -hmm. um, they've got, a, you know, the rooms and that are beautifully uh, laid out. Um, the They've got a number of uh, sort of guest areas. So, again, you're not having the lodge all descending onto one area. Um, you've got a number of pools. You've got the most incredible spa. Um, Jack Hanna, uh, who is the world-known uh, late zoologist, um, where previous to one and only taking over this property, Jack Hanna had his home there, which you could stay in, and I've stayed there. And now they've converted it very much into sort of a, a club type feeling. There's a, a billiard room, and you know, and it's lovely just to have you know drinks there before your dinner. Uh, but it's another area that people can get away with. From a location point of view, and I do think that people need to take this into account, or well, I certainly take into account when we're planning um, the experience, is it's relatively in the middle of where the National Parks offices is and to with the various uh, entry points of the National Park. So you're not having to get up at the crack of dawn to do like sort of an hour's drive to mm -hmm. <clears throat> the National Park. Mm -hmm. So this location is very good. Okay. I think it was, I think it was one, of, one of the first ones, right? Originally, um, one, it was actually owned by Dubai World. Oh, okay. And um, one and only bought it. And it's only just recently opened as one and only. But the lodge itself, you are correct, was one of the original lodges in the area, but not under one and only. Okay. Um, and then it's it also... Under I think one of the bigger ones, 20, 24 rooms. And 25 like you rooms, said, 25, please. Yeah. 25 rooms, okay. So it, and it has a pool, so they don't all have the sort of extra pool fitness center, but this is one of the bigger ones that does. It is, and you know, there's also bearing in mind where you are, and I know it's because, you know, people say, well, you've, you're coming to hike the gorilla, so you should be fit, but there are some properties which we've got to take into account that it is quite a hike from where you get, uh, from your arrival point to up to the property. Um, so this one and Sangita, um, Kotondo are sort of on level. So you will arrive, um, and, and one and only have, actually have golf carts in between the properties or in between the units. Um, and Sangita, it's all on ground level. Um, so there's no hiking to get to your unit, unlike Basati and Sabino. Okay. That's good to know. And so here's a picture of the Sangita. Beautiful. Um, it really is. <laughs> it looks lovely with that view. <clears throat> they've done a fantastic job. They really have. Um, 
again, you know, taking into, uh, they've taken the community uh, in mind, they've worked with various conservation organizations, and um, they're just such a responsible company. Mm -hmm. The views, I mean, that was from the room that I stayed in. Um, they're enormous. You've got your private plunge pool area. That was look, overlooking um, one of the volcanoes. Um, and in that area in front, often we actually, when we were there, we walked up in the afternoon. We had a lovely walk and we walked up towards Buffalo. Um, there were lots of uh, antelope in the area. So there is wildlife in the area. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful activities here. Um, you can uh, learn to... Uh, weave baskets, uh, carve, beading. Um, they've got a wonderful center which they've partnered with the local community. So, you know, you're normally getting back from gorilla trekking at about two, three o'clock, depending on how long you've trekked for. And you do have a couple of hours. Uh, um, they've got the most incredible uh, vegetable garden um, there as well, which you can go and visit. Um, they've done a fantastic job. We also mustn't forget about uh, Kataza, which is Kataza House, which is their private villa four bedrooms right next door to this property, but absolutely perfect for, you know, a, a large group of friends or a family there. They've got two swimming pools, lots of public area. Um, and of course, guests have access uh, to the main lodge too, should they wish to come down. Mm -hmm. St. is known for their wine. They're known for their food. They've got a wonderful wine uh, cellar. We did wine tasting while we were there. It's, you know, it's not what you go for, but it's certainly all these little extras which just make it special. Yeah. Um, I thought Singita's briefing the night before was superb. Their buy-in if I to your gorilla experience is remarkable. Mm. They've got this wonderful room um, which has <clears throat> lots of information about the gorillas and about Dana Fossey. Um, they've actually got Dana Fossey's photographer, all his equipment. Who's, he passed away not so long ago, and that equipment was passed, uh, was donated to them. Um, their kit room is unbelievable with as far as, you know, your, your gaiters and your even boots, uh, everything you can imagine that you need, they've got it there for you, and it's included. Um, so they've really, really, they understand that this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience for a guest, and Bearing in mind, they've got nothing to do with the permits. You know, the, the gorilla trekking is really not their baby, but yet they've bought in uh, to your experience and made sure that everything is taken care of as Sangeeta does. I love it. So, I mean, they're obviously well known as a high-end luxury safari company all throughout Africa, but to hear your expertise and your perspective about how magical it is, is really <clears throat> good to know because it might come at a really high price point, but if it's worth it, then, you know, you're up for it. But it, worth, yeah. you never want to pay that much and not have it be worth it. But it sounds like it's worth it. No, it's worth every cent in my mind. Okay, good. And then this is kind of, I guess, a, this is the one more outlier in the group of the different lodges that we're going to talk about. Yes. Tell us a little bit about this one. This is Sabinho. It's a community-owned uh, property in partnership with Governors. Um, and in actual fact, Governors is owned by Wilderness. Okay. Okay. Um, so wilderness is also involved. Wilderness Safari is also involved here. Um, it was recent. When I say recently, you know, twenty twenty wasn't a year for us. So probably uh, twenty nineteen or twenty eighteen, um, it had a total soft refurb. So the lodge is looking beautiful. This is one of the properties that, as I mentioned, you need to climb up to. Um, so you need to be fit. You land and you you know you've got a good few stairs to get up to it. Um, they lovely little rooms, uh, little fireplaces and good sized uh, uh, bathrooms, wonderful view and a lovely main area. Um, I would call this sort of more a top end four entry level five uh, experience. Um, but, you know, this was the most luxury property five years ago in, in Rwanda, you know, before uh, Basati and one and only and um, uh, Sangita opened, this was it. And I guess all of it. Yeah, well, it looks very cozy. I mean, all of these, I think many of them have fireplaces in them, you know, yes. for that sort of cold or damp morning um, or evening. Um, and it just looks so very cozy and lush um, to be snuggled up in one of these little cottages. Very much so. Um, and now here's the opposite end of a very sort of contemporary <laughs> modern interpretation. Wilderness Safaris Basate lounges are lodges that look 
slightly like they're from another planet. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you do have to wonder what these architects are on when they design yeah. those. <laughs> <laughs> he was definitely in some sort of like Dr. Seuss mode or something, I think. It was. And, you know, they try and tell us that, you know, they call them nests. So it's supposed to be what a gorilla's nest looks like. So, you know, you've got uh, six nests. Um you know, each unit that you see there, to the left is the, the, the bedroom, uh, and then to the right is the bathroom. Um, they have the most incredible views uh, from a, a sense of destination. Um, it's unbelievable. So, you know, that's the main area there. And your meals are done off to the uh, right to the far end and onto the veranda area. And this is taken sort of from the bar area looking down. Um, it is a beautiful lodge. It really is. And I, what's very exciting for me with Bisati is Wilderness has opened a day lounge. Mm -hmm. um, so so often you get guests who actually hike on the day they're going to depart. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can imagine, guests need to check out as anywhere else in the world needs to check out by 10. Uh, so the arriving guests, the rooms are ready. Um, and they don't offer a late checkout as such. Um, it just doesn't work in these remote areas. <laughs> so um, guests can leave for their trek, and then when they come back, all their, their, their luggage and that has been taken over to the day, the, the day lounge, which has uh, showers and changing rooms. It has the most beautiful restaurant with lovely views. It's got uh, quite an impressive retail therapy area, so some good uh, shopping with a lot of local, with that partnered with local villages and that to, you know, Love produce uh, goods in there that they sell so that is and there's no extra charge for that so you mm -hmm. know for me that is a big big uh, uh, plus for selling this property yeah. um in the same jar if you arrive early in the morning you know you can arrive and have sort of breakfast or lunch and you know just uh, chill there while yeah. you are waiting for your room to be ready yeah i um, think um you, you know, I mentioned I just finished my wilderness safari certification, and that was one of the key items that you don't hear about that in, you know, not just Rwanda, but, you know, in all the different lodges. And I think for a lot of people, if you've ever experienced having to leave your room at 12, but you don't have to leave the property until four and you feel a little homeless, like they're very intentionally making a place that feels like home for you, which is really very lovely. much so. Yeah, very much so. Love that. Um Magashi. So now we're transitioning over to the Akagera National Park. Um, I love this because are you are they all the arrivals by boat there? No. So you actually you'd either come in by road or you'd fly. Uh, but a lot of the activities are done by boat. By boat. Yeah. Um, and again, I agree. I love it. You know, for me, a lot of your game drives. You know, even on the driving, you are driving around, um, and it's all the waters sort of in the background. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so different. And especially if you've come in, say, from the Serengeti or from the Masai Mara, where you've been really focused on ground safaris, so land safaris, as we call them, very little water around. And then to come over and do three nights here pre your gorilla trekking or possibly post, I would recommend pre. Um, and you've got all this wildlife with this enormous lake behind it as it's, it's setting, it is special. And then going out on the boat, um, you know, we saw wonderful herds of elephants. I mean, crocodiles, you know, I would even, I wouldn't want to fall into that water. There's just so many crocs, so no many hippos. Yeah, no swimming you know, in that water. The birds are incredible. It really was special. I Magashi stole my heart in so many ways. Um, mm -hmm. The tents, uh, which I'm sure there is a photo of there, they're beautifully done. Again, sense of destination, authenticity, it just oozes it. Um, there we go. You know, yeah. and um, great, you can see the, the good space between the two. Um, lovely on suite. six tents, I think, right? Yeah, they're small. They are in the process of, and again, COVID unfortunately has delayed things, but they are in the process of doing a little magashi. Okay. Um, so there will be another uh, uh, camp there. Uh, but certainly, and again, this has just really put Rwanda on the map as a destination. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. just gorillas. The wildlife here, the lion, the leopard. Um, and for the birders, you know, the big thing here um, is you've got some incredible special birds in this area. Uh, one of them is a shoebill. You know, it's a very um, rare sighted bird um, mm. occurring in this sort of swamp um, 
type uh, vegetation. Um, and it hadn't been seen for about five or six years. And I believe it was May this year. And since May, they've had a number of sightings for it. So if you've got any twitches or any twitches want to, you know, Rwanda is a destination. There's some real special birds in that area. Okay. Well, it sounds lovely. Um, we're going to skip back. I had this one out of order. Tell us a little bit about Virunga. So Virunga, owned by volcanoes, a lovely lodge, and it overlooks what we call the Twin Lakes. Um, so here you've got, um, it is about an hour from the, 40 minutes to an hour from the from the National Parks um, uh, station where you start. But then there are uh, entry points to the National Park, which are quite close. So you don't necessarily going to do an hour either way, right. um, but you certainly will in the morning. Um, I would say this is very much on the same level as Sabinho. Uh, from a, a good four five star entry, lovely big rooms, as I say, amazing view, good food, um, and it's just a really good place uh, to base yourself for the gorillas. Mm -hmm. um, from here, you can also do canoeing on the lakes. You can go out on the boats. Um, you know, there's a lot that can be done in this region, and I think we'll talk about that just now about all the other activities beyond the gorillas um, that can be done. Absolutely. So, um, where are we? We have one more. Okay. <laughs> the other one and only lodge, which again, another yeah. stunning picture. It's just absolutely beautiful. What are all of the, clearly it's surrounded by a lot of greenery. Are those any sort of um, like farming or is it all just plants? There's a lot of tea in the area uh, oh. and coffee plantations okay. um, in this particular area. Um, and then obviously you've got the forest here uh, and the forest is just absolutely incredible. Um, as we spoke very briefly earlier on, um, it's got quite a, uh, a canopy walk. Um, it's about 160 meters. It takes two hours. And you're walking approximately 70 meters high. So it's really above the tree line. Yeah. Um, some amazing, amazing uh, views um, of the forest. And then the, the chance of seeing the, the chimps, uh, the colobus monkeys, uh, you know, some of the smaller antelope that occur in this area. Again, this would be something that would be more of a chilled experience. So once you've done the gorillas, once you've done Akigera, and you're just looking for something to just relax and have a few days out, you can go by road. It's a few hours drive, or it's about just under an hour helicopter from one and only um, uh, volcanoes down uh, to Nungwe. Okay. We'll talk about helicopters in a minute. So let's touch on, like you said, some of the other things. I mean, we have talked a little bit about you can go out canoeing, you can go out um, on boats, you can go, you know, do a boat safari at um, some of the lodges. Obviously, we have the wild animals. Um, what about some of the cultural experiences that you can have well, with the people? And I think that's so important, especially when it comes to Rwanda. You know, you had this horrendous or the scale of violence, unbelievable to man, you know, in 20, uh, 19, um, uh, sorry, I've gone blank, 1994. Um, and to see how this, uh, the, the population has grown and got over it is absolutely amazing. So you've got the Genocide Memorial, um, which is well worth a visit in Kigali. Um, you spend the day, you know, this day touring Kigali itself. There's some amazing markets. And uh, bearing, a lot, bearing in mind both men, women, and children were killed uh, during that genocide, but there were a lot of women as well, that, or young girls who have grown up with our parents. Um, so there's a lot of women societies um, and uh, operations that teach them and give them the, the means to um, support themselves and their, their children and their families. Um, for example, uh, out of uh, one and only or any of the lodges, in fact, up in um, volcanoes, you can go through to a coffee farm. You can do cupping, which is coffee tasting. You can see how the coffee's grown, harvested, etc. And that particular uh, coffee operation is uh, fully woman-owned and operated, which is a wonderful thing to see. Um, in that area as well, you can go for a walk through the villages, and you would walk with one of the uh, the liaison officers, as they call them, at any of the lodges. Mm -hmm. So it's not staged in any way; it's authentic. You know, you just stroll through the village, you chat to 
whoever may be. And, you know, the, the villages are, again, everywhere in no one. Everyone is so welcoming and just want to share their lives with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what people must remember, this isn't poverty you're looking at. This is folks living in a comfortable, traditional way of life. Um, so they don't want you to feel sorry for them. They're happy there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a wonderful experience. Canoeing on both the lakes is also a river just outside of uh, the volcanoes area that you can um, canoe on. Um, for folks who are interested in uh, mountain biking, horseback riding, archery, all of that, that can be done out of Kigali. So there are a lot of activities um, that can be done, that can be active. And don't forget, when we have around the gorilla trekking, you can also do golden monkeys, which is also a permit. Um, it's $100 for the permit. And you also get up early in the morning and you can go and trek these golden monkeys, which is also a great experience. So, you know, that's an additional experience. You can, of course, trek to Diana Fossey's uh, research station, mm -hmm. um, which is quite a trek, but well worth it, her grave. You know, there's so many active experiences that can mm -hmm. be done. Um, mm -hmm. in Rwanda. Which my clients tend to love. So I always love knowing that there's lots of options. It's not just there's one thing that you're doing. Yeah, very much so. Uh <laughs> So this is funny, but my puppy would like to come in. So hold on one second. <laughs> <laughs> come here, Tigger. Come here, bud. There you go. Hopefully that will quiet her down. Hopefully that will quiet her down. Um, the perils of recording. Oops, sorry, bud. At home. Um, okay. So what about the good to know logistics part of things? We touched a little bit on the cost of what gorilla permits are, um, the logistics of being there. Some people go into a gorilla check for one day. Some people mm -hmm. go twice. Um, mm -hmm. What do you like to recommend to people? You know, again, it comes down to what people, are, folks are comfortable spending. Um, you know, a lot of, as because you're pretty much guaranteed to see them, that one day experience is wonderful. Though you've come all the way, you know, to have that, and if you can, I would always recommend do a second permit. And the reason for this is you could see the gorillas, but they may be in a forested area with a heavy canopy. The light may not be good for photography. It may be in a thick area. So, you know, the gorillas, are, you can see them, but they're moving around. So in my mind, I would always try and have a second permit. And in the hopes you see a different family, different makeup of family, maybe more babies, maybe a bigger silverback, which is generally the older male. Um, Ultimately, we want them out in the uh, in the bamboo or out in the open areas when they're feeding. It's good light for photography, easy to see the animals. So that is important. Um, entry point is always Kigali. Um, and most of the flights are arriving in the evening. Uh, some of the flights that, you know, your regional from Tanzania or Kenya, you can get sort of earlier in the day. I always say spend the night in Kigali. Um, it's a, a vibrant city. Um, there's wonderful local restaurants to go and see and experience. Um, again, the people are amazing. And you need time to go and see the genocide uh, memorial, the markets, and then you drive up. It's only about a two, about a two and a half, three hour drive through one of the most beautiful countries. Rwanda, uh, you know, means a uh, uh, country of a thousand hills. And it certainly is. You know, it's undulating uh, with all the coffee and tea uh, plantations along the way, potato, Irish potatoes. Um, so it's well worth the drive. Um, and then, you know, you can go from there. A lot of our guests will helicopter one way, um, which is also to see the country from the sky. Um, you know, it's spectacular. I know you recently did one in um, Alaska and absolutely loved it. Love it. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's funny. It's like a dual purpose, right? It gets you there yeah. much more efficiently, quicker. But my gosh, to see all of the stunning landscape from above, you can't beat it. It's like its own excursion, even if it wasn't it's, getting you somewhere. Yeah, oh, very much so. And what we do a lot, what I love doing with our guests is we, you know, your first night in uh, Kigali and then you go down to um, Akigera to Magashi by road, um, you know, it's a two and a half hour drive, but again, a beautiful drive, and then have the helicopter pick you up from Akigera and then fly you over to volcanoes, um, and then do your, you know, do your tr gorilla trekking, and then from there, drive back into Kigali. Um, so that's it, or fly back, whichever you want. Um, you know, from a weight perspective, we always take care of the luggage, so there's not, you know, nothing to worry about that. We make sure the luggage, you know, either leaves earlier or arrives later, whichever. Um, but uh, certainly well worth doing. Helicopters are great from a safety perspective. You know, we always make sure that the, the, the company is uh, it's owned by the government and properly taken care of. So no issues there. Okay, good to know. And then what about weather mm -hmm. and seasonality? What would you recommend as different times of the year? Advantage? Yeah. 
percentages. Again, it's so difficult, especially for the height, you know, your altitude that you're dealing with. So rain does come and go. Um, I personally, April and May are not the greatest months. Uh, it is a rainy season. And then for some, you know, often we're finding rain in October at this time of the year. Um, so those are sort of the three months that I personally like to avoid uh, for our guests. Um, other than that, of course, your summer months are absolutely perfect um, for both the gorillas as well as uh, Magashi um, okay. and uh, Nungwe. Um, and obviously from a pre and post, you know, whether you're coming in from the Serengeti or the Masamara, those are the times of the year that it's so wonderful for those areas too. So it really works well as a summer trip. And then something that comes up in different countries in Africa, malaria. Do people need to worry about that in Rwanda? If you're going straight into, you know, Kigali and then straight up, um, it's not a big issue, certainly at that altitude. We do recommend, um, though, when you're doing other areas, Magashi sort of low-lying areas, is to take your malaria prophylaxis. Okay, good to know. And then... Here's a question. I think I know the answer to it. Have you ever had anybody go to Rwanda to see gorillas and be disappointed in the experience? Or is it one of those yeah. magical moments that you would you would expect it to be? It's one of those magical moments. Uh, you know, we get more. I've done it nine times now. Um, and every time I've been, obviously, I've been sometimes with our own guests or sometimes with other folk that are part of the group uh, traveling. And it's we more often get tears of happiness and joy. Um, than anything else. It really is, um, it's a bucket list experience for so many people. Mm -hmm. um, and it certainly lives up to its reputation. Mm -hmm. So nice to hear. I think that's what um, most people would think of when they're thinking about doing something like this. I mean, a safari is on many people's bucket lists and gorilla trekking is just, you know, sort of like one extra bonus. Um, Very much so. so before we go, let's just touch on real quick. You mentioned, you know, people coming from the Serengeti or other places. In an ideal world, would you say that there are a couple countries that are great complement with a Rwandan gorilla trekking experience? I think, and, you know, it is opened up so that we could even include countries like Southern Africa or South Africa. So people who are doing a Botswana-South Africa combo or Zimbabwe-Botswana-South Africa combo. There's an, a flight from Johannesburg into Kigali. It's about five hours. Um, but, you know, I've never been one to really encourage including, you know, doing an East Africa-Southern Africa combination. It's just too much. But certainly if you're just going into see Rwanda um, uh, for the gorillas, definitely you could add it on from a Southern Africa itinerary. Um, it makes a lot of sense, of course, from Kenya or Tanzania. Both of them, you know, ten, you can be having, you can have a game drive in the morning, watching the migration in Tanzania, come back, have lunch, and be in Kigali for a cocktail in the evening. Uh, very easy, you know, fly to stop, clear immigration, and come uh, a customs at Mwanza, and then you hop over the lake uh, and you in Kigali. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Tanzania and Kenya are the easiest uh, and shortest connections, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly don't rule out Southern Africa. Um, well, that's good information to know. I think so much of safaris is about the logistics. It's not just about these spectacular places you can go stay. It's about how frequently does the transportation get you there? And does it make sense to go from one place to another place in what order, depending upon how amazing it is? You always want to end up in the best place. Exactly. Um, so lots of great insights. And I so appreciate your time today. This has been delightful. And I'm looking forward to... Lots of people heading to Africa as the world opens back up again and having the opportunity to see some of these magical wildlife animals in the um, in their natural habitat. So thank you. It's an absolute pleasure, Mimi. Thank you for hosting today. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you to Rwanda. Yes. Well, we'll get there one day for sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll see you in Kenya next year for sure. Look so forward to it. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.